Hello and welcome to Silent Fire, Silent Fire, the podcast. You mouthed that at me. I did. I did mouth that at you. I wasn't yes. sure if you wanted me to do it. Yeah. No, no. I, I'm good doing it. Okay, yeah. Good, um, good. Yeah. Well, you could do it too. That's fine. You say Silent Fire. Silent Fire. Okay. Silent Fire. There we go. Uh, it, this is a podcast we talk where we talk about experiencing the life of God from various different denominational backgrounds, mm-hmm. and we're trying to find common language to express our hearts for Jesus mm-hmm. and how we've come to know him and, uh, and things of that nature. And so it's all about understanding and exploring life in God and the life of God. Yeah. Uh, so welcome. I, my name is Joshua Hofford. I'm with Colin Nicole. Colin Nicole is an official Anglican priest. I am. I just took the collar out of my pocket. So I'm <laughs> casual today. Ah, oh, casual. <laughs> yes. Um, and, uh, and I run a ministry called Wind Ministries. Mm-hmm. Uh, where we teach people to hear God, to experience God, to live in God, and develop uh, spiritual maturity and deep roots in the life of God. Um, and so, and both of us, we kind of have this passion for church history, the mm-hmm. church fathers, and um, and have similarities there. So, welcome to another podcast. And today, uh, oh, if you want to take a second and uh, subscribe to yeah. the YouTube channel, that would be wonderful. Click yeah. like. Click subscribe and and the notification bell so you yeah, know because we're yeah. starting to go live more often on YouTube. Yeah. And don't forget to comment too. We love to engage yes. with people even after the video premieres and all that. Leave questions and comments, Absolutely. criticisms. Yep, criticisms. And, uh, yeah. are welcome and uh, and we'll be happy to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and if you're listening on the podcast, mm. uh, welcome on Google, Apple, Spotify, all those types of things. Yeah. So, yeah, it's wonderful. To Amazon have, now, too. Yeah, Amazon now. Yeah. Oh, look at that. We're official. Um, okay. So, today, the what we're talking about is um, what do we mean and, what is, and what's the implication, the application? So, what do we mean, one, and then what's the application mm. and implication of it when we talk about, in, from the Anglican perspective, and then from the charismatic evangelical perspective, um, what do we mean when we say that Jesus was fully man? Mm. Uh, or looking at the, is it the, it was definitely Augustine, but there was other guys, the God became man so that man might become God. Right, right. Um, and so what do we, how do we understand that? How does that apply to us? What are the outworkings of that? And there's some, there's some tricky language. Yeah. Um, in there cross denominationally mm. and what we say, what we mean. So, um, and so we just thought we would talk about that today. Yeah. And what does it, what does it mean? What's the, what does it mean to say that Jesus was fully man? Sure. Um, sure. and how do we think about that in a, in a real healthy way? And mm. then how do we think about that from our different, uh, backgrounds? Yeah. Um, so Colin, why don't you just kind of okay. start <laughs> us off? Sure, sure. <laughs> you know, it's one of these, it's one of these things that, um, as we've talked about in the past with on other uh, you know other episodes we're a, we are a liturgical church so we are i think you said today we were having coffee and Josh is like you know you're a you're a creedal church is that what you call us which which i think what you meant was we're a church that recites the creeds yes yeah uh, yes and, and indeed you know the creeds much, are are very foundational to you guys well foundational and yeah. pretty normative within our worship like yes. that's, that's something right. that we don't um, you know, I think for all Christians, the creeds are foundational, but for right. us, um, you know, in terms of how they inform belief for us, it's something that actually pretty much at every service, we recite either the apostles or the Nicene Creed. So would it shock you to know that, I don't want to distract from what you were saying, would sure. it shock you to know that when I, I grew up in church, right, yeah. and I had no idea what a creed was, right, probably until That's I was true. about 25 and started exploring it on myself it's a bit shocking <laughs> yeah. growing up as a young roman catholic you were taught i mean the lord's prayer i think was the first oh yeah we knew the lord's prayer, prayer. for oh, sure yeah you probably didn't know the hail mary alongside that i was taught the hail no. mary and the lord's prayer no. at the same time and then of course the creed was the next thing i was taught yeah Ap- apostles creed apostles creed. Yeah. yeah right uh, and that would have been sort of required for our confirmation and all that stuff. sure but anyway um so it's something that you know is is um foundational to our to our belief, and that is is a regular thing. That said, as I've said with other things before, you know, it's not something that if you go and ask your your average Anglican parishioner sure. anywhere, you say, well, what does it mean when, when God became, you know, when Jesus was fully man and fully divine? You know, I, I don't know what theological literacy is like around that topic. Sure, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I think for us, what that means, what I often, when I talk to people, when I preach about that, when that comes up in, uh, in sermons or, or in teachings, you know, for me, what it means when I talk about 
Jesus's humanity is I say, look, you know, what it means is that God actually has experienced the fullness of, of human experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that means that when we pray and, and what we worship is, you know, someone that, you know, when we're suffering, we're not praying to some sort of distant God that, sure. that, that has never known what suffering is. Right. Um, right. Now that might be, there might be some people might say, well, there's, there's issues with that, but I certainly think, I mean, yeah, there, I, yeah, there's, I mean, I can think of certain people that would say that for yeah. sure. But yeah. I mean, fact is, is that God became man, yeah. uh, took on human flesh, remained divine at the same time. Of course, yeah. we'll get into yeah. that. But, um, you know, Jesus knew pain. Right. Jesus knew suffering. Yeah. Um, and well, and I think, you know, I think that the, probably the pushback you would get theologically from that, just, just, and it wouldn't even really be a in or out question right. in terms right. of the nature of Jesus, would be one to say that, G, that, that um, God became man. Mm -hmm. as opposed to God assumed humanity. Right. Um, right. And I think that would probably be some of the, the, and that's English language, right? That's some of the fine line sure, distinctions sure. we might make. Um, yes. Because speaking of God becoming something that he wasn't. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, that I think there, there you'd have some of the early church fathers going, hold on a sec. Right. Okay. Right. He assumed humanity. Yes. And he didn't become something that he, that he wasn't. And then... Um, I, I, I think that the idea of his human suffering, um, allowing us to see the compassion, the tenderness of the father, that's absolutely mm -hmm. something that we can, that we can explore and think about. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the pushback you'd get also would be the, um, thinking that the, that quote unquote, the God of the old Testament somehow had no idea what suffering was like. Right. And somehow I had no idea what pain and, and the loss and regret mm -hmm. and maybe regret is, you know, there's the one part where it says God regretted making humankind, right? Mm -hmm. There's, that's mm -hmm. kind of a problematic verse people try and figure out. Mm -hmm. Not that we're going there today. No. Um, but, you know, in, in, in that conversation, that's not, it's not that you said anything wrong or anything. It's just sure. going, there's people argue over the, the oh, slightest. Sure. People have died over this. People slightest. have died. Um, yeah, yeah, it's right. Killed over it. Yes. And I think that's one of those things where, you know, if I, if I put on a different hat kind of thing, you know, I would, I would probably say, you know, theologically, if we're, if we're speaking in a, in a particular way, we sure. have to be more precise. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Pastorally, I think there's latitude. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's you know, so well said um, yes. to kind of do those things. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're getting down to the nitty gritty and the, and the fine, the fine print, right. Yeah. You got to be precise and, and there, there could be issues with the way we talk about that, right. but you also pastorally, I mean, you do, sometimes there's a tendency when, with this stuff and I, I can't think of an example offhand, but there are certainly moments where if we get too loosey goosey with how we talk about it, right. um, you know, we can actually kind of err into things that are just not true. And, and that might have, have something, you know, come to bear on our discussion just in terms of um, what about people who don't believe in the, you know, um, how, how does, I mean, how does belief affect salvation when it comes to believing in, in a way right. the kind of minute details of, right. uh, of, of, you know, theology and the creeds and right. that sort of thing. Like if someone said, you know, well, I, I'll say the creed and I do this, but I, uh, you know, I, d I don't believe that Jesus was both fully man and fully divine. You right. know, I, I right. take an Arian position or something like that. Right. Um, how do we respond to that, I guess? Yeah. Is a, and that's not a question for us to answer. No, well, it's but a it's, a, I mean, it's a pertinent question. Yeah. Um, and, and especially thinking through how we, t we live, I mean, we live in Canada, mm -hmm. um, but largely the West is becoming a post-Christian mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. um, we're, you know, and that's kind of a, a a nice buzzword that people use right now. And it, it basically just means that there are probably less Christians in terms of formal practice yeah. than there are non-Christians. Yeah. Right. Um, so you have a, you have a, a society that has largely, it's not necessarily abandoned Western Christian values, mm -hmm. but most people, but, but I shouldn't say most, but a number of people have walked away from the idea of being a Christian. Sure. Right. So, you, so we're in a post-Christian society. Mm -hmm. um, and post and post-Christian too, in the way that the underlying sort of assumptions and things that have once guided society, you know, like yes. morality is yes. no longer kind of, we're not primarily looking to, to Christianity and, and yes. to kind of guide that too. And know? so have, so it, with that said, yeah. Having those having those conversations about the divinity of Christ, about the nature of Christ, and 
and and actually exploring that um it, it's probably more important now sure yeah. than it was maybe maybe 20 years ago when sure. people you could just kind of you know throw a rock and hit a christian yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and that's and that depends on where you're if you're in texas you can still do that yeah. um well and just as an a- anecdotal thing to that you know i um was in a parish where they were doing alpha one time it was a training parish for me a church and uh and they ran the alpha and it was like there was older people that went like people in their 70s 80s and they went to the first one and and the first number of them and walked out and sort of said to the pastor they're like this is like what are we doing this is like foundational stuff everyone should know this like right you know when you talk right. about jesus being fully fully divine and fully human they're just like we learned that in sunday school right and the answer to it, of course, was you did, but you know. But there's a lot of people that, in a world yeah, where people. That's right. You know, we do have to be precise, and we do have to talk about yeah. this, and we do have to do have to discuss it because people don't know it anymore. Yeah, and and it gets, it. I mean, it's important. Like just thinking about the nature of Jesus as fully man. Mm-hmm. That and and it's. I think it's Gregory. Um, it's either Gregory Nazianzen or Leo the Great. I think it's Gregory kind of carries this ethos anyway in some of his orations. I had a friend turn me on to some of them um, yeah, a few months ago, and I was still just kind of studying through what Gregory said. But essentially, Gregory's point is that if whatever, what Jesus assumed, he redeemed. Hmm. And so in assuming humanity, the, the point of assuming humanity wasn't necessarily to change anything within the Godhead or Jesus as the word, right? Um, the triune, you know, any, any part of the God, the triune Godhead to, to, to extend anything into the Godhead or to, or to change the nature of the Godhead or mm-hmm. to, or to um, teach the Godhead um, something in particular. Mm-hmm. The, and, and then, so then you'd look at some of the stuff like Augustinian Trinitarian theology would talk about, well, Jesus learned obedience through his suffering um, Jesus was tempted at, and you know, sin is a perfect high priest. The, the parsing that out would be things like, well, those verses very specifically refer to the 30 year human episode in, um, the member of the Trinity called the son. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Um, and so those are distinctly pointing to the humanity of Jesus. They're not pointing to the divinity of Jesus. Right. And, um, and so God becoming man Jesus assuming human flesh, the the point of that process wasn't for this is the distinction. It wasn't for God. Right, right, right. The point of it was for humankind. Sure. And, yeah. And one of the things that's you I mean, you see this, um, and I've just been preaching about this at our at our church. You see this in um the gospels that the emphasis on the resurrection of Jesus is the bodily resurrection. Mm-hmm. It's, um, and that's important Mm -hmm. that they, and Paul tries to, I mean, he tries to reason through this when he's going like in in the resurrection, what kind of bodies are we going to have and all this? And we don't quite know. And it's kind of a mystery. Yeah. Um, but you've got the emphasis on Jesus walking through a wall or appearing in a room, however that happens, but saying, touch my hands. Right. So, you know, he's not just an apparition. There's actual substance. He eats too. He eats. Yeah. He eats. He makes a, he makes a breakfast of fish for Peter on the, uh, for the disciples on the shore. So there's this emphasis on the fact that he is, he is fully resurrected. Mm -hmm. He's, this is proof that he's fully Mm -hmm. God, Mm -hmm. that this, this, if he was just fully man and he wasn't also fully Mm -hmm. God, then there'd be no resurrection, Mm -hmm. which, which is a really important point to hammer home, hammer home pastorally, because often I find the assumption is when you talk about the resurrection, people are like, well, he was just sort of a spirit and you have to say, no, no, he ate. It's not like Ghostbusters where you eat and it just falls right through the ground. He ate, right? Like there is this redemption of the flesh. Yes. Um, and even, even, and I'm looking right now, you can't see it on the camera, but I'm looking, there's an ascension window um, behind the camera at the back yes. of the church. And it's, it's, it's Christ ascending and the scars are in his feet, right? The holes right. of the nails right. are in his feet. Right. And, that, and that's always, you know, uh, reminds us about what's being done for the body. Yes. And I think to, to an earlier point, it's always sort of dicey and dangerous anytime we start to say, well, God needed this. Yeah, right. 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 I mean, that's yeah. kind of a good marker to go, wait a minute. Right. You know, yes. Um, and that, yeah, absolutely. That's so, that's so true. Yeah. Cause you can't, you, you can't, I mean, if, a, if he's, if he is sovereign, self-sufficient, God is life. We have mm-hmm. a life, you know, mm-hmm, different, mm-hmm. those are, those are different 
terminologies um, that he is self-sufficient. He has no need within himself. Mm-hmm. So when he assumed humanity, he didn't assume humanity for himself to right. learn something or, or, or anything of that nature. It was his plan to redeem humankind. Mm-hmm. So the fact that Jesus resurrects in a body um, and then, it, and then it ascends on the, what, on the 40th day after his resurrection, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the, you know, the ascension to the right hand of the father yes. and he's pictured ascending in bodily form. Yes. And the idea in the early church, and I think it, I think this is vitally important to understand today is that in his ascension, we ascend with him. Hmm. And so it's in, because humanity ascended. We, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because at, because he was resurrected in bodily form, this means that the div- the divine word united yet no not mixed distinct mm-hmm. yet yet united the divine word with human humanity ascends to the father and now humankind is seated next to the father yes right yeah. in jesus by faith in jesus humanity itself humanity kind of itself thing. kind of yeah. is yeah. so we've been redeemed we've been placed in that place we've been restored and then 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 peter uses language like in second peter 1 4 that we have become we have been made partakers of the divine nature mm-hmm. having received these precious promises and escaping the corruption corruption of the flesh mm-hmm. so this is this is the point is that in him being human mm-hmm. it's vitally important that he was resurrected as human mm-hmm. Not so that God became human, but so that we were able to find that place with the Father again. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, fall versus yeah. he who descended also ascended. Sure, right. Sure. And uh, uh, yeah. Ephesians four talks about that. Um, there's, there's this, and I, I, and I was sharing this with you the other day, and you're just kind of the shock mm-hmm. on your face. Oh, right. This kind of this is this is a a fairly typical way that the charismatic church expresses um, or or people that have been involved in the charismatic church you know depending on word of faith depending on because there's there's all kinds of different strains within the evangelical mindset and framework um, the and it's called the kenosis gospel is kind of the, the okay. terminology people use and it it looks at Philippians 2 which is funny because Philippians 2 for Augustine for Basil for Athanasius and all these great Trinitarian theologians Philippians 2 was foundational to understanding the nature of Jesus and what he accomplished as the word right. incarnating in flesh I mean you they they almost the entirety of how they interpreted Jesus and um, what scripture says about his humanity is filtered through Philippians mm-hmm. 2. And so you get this, this thought process that goes something like this, because it depends on who you talk to, right. but it's something along these lines. Um, kenosis, by the way, is the word in Philippians 2 for emptied. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it says Jesus emptied himself mm-hmm. and took on the form of a servant and didn't consider equality with God a thing to be great. He didn't let this mind be within you that was within Jesus Christ who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but rather emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. And so in, in the, the understanding, and this is probably where the charismatic church gets really iffy and wishy-washy with mm-hmm. its language. The charismatic church, because the, the primacy and the emphasis is on the role of the Holy Spirit right, within right. the inner life of the believer and then expressing itself through tongues, prophecy, mm-hmm. visions, manifestations, this kind of stuff. That Jesus emptied himself and then was filled at the baptism. Mm -hmm. And in being filled was empowered and enabled by God, the Father, to walk in a way um, that modeled the life of divinity Mm -hmm. so that we could do those things as well. Right. So he was emptied and then filled. And in being emptied, the Holy Spirit came and the Holy Spirit in coming at the baptism was the sign that Jesus now has received the grace to walk out and fulfill his call and accomplish these signs and wonders and things yeah, like yeah. that. And and that's kind of how it's thought. Yeah. Yeah, and this isn't I mean I'm not I'm not like this isn't like fringe no 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 thought no, process. Sure, sure, this sure. is and you I mean you see the logic behind it, right? Oh, you're sure, kind sure. of you're working no. this out. Well, he emptied himself and then because what we talk about in the in, and this is Pentecostal language too. Right, is right. we we talk about being filled with the Spirit, mm-hmm. you know. So that we we and you guys probably wouldn't do this as another conversation for another time. Is we talk about um, uh, the 
baptism of the spirit, mm -hmm. which is distinctly different than baptism right. by water. Right. And, uh, and that would be a, a unique experience in the Holy spirit. Um, and, and then, you know, some people might talk about a becoming, this is the language, mm -hmm. the charismatic language is then you become leaky. So you need to be filled. <laughs> I, I love it when you laugh at these yeah. things. Then it's you just, become leaky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you never knew that when we started off on there these podcast this, things yeah. that I was going to start introducing you to this There's really this whole world I just didn't know existed. Yeah. <laughs> you become leaky. Yeah. And you need to be filled. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of a pejorative way of saying it, but sure. that's, that's kind of the language, right? So in Jesus being baptized in water, then he's baptized in the spirit. And so now we have the normal experience of baptism by water which has happened. And then we have the baptism by spirit, which is the Holy Spirit descent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so this is Jesus's experience of being filled with the spirit. Yeah. So because he emptied himself, now he's, now he has, now he's filled. And so I want to get your thoughts on it. I don't know. Josh. I, don't know. <laughs> I just, look, I have, I have, you know, I mean, there's like words in that now. I mean, I assume that everything you've said is kind of like would be Pentecostals are watching this going, yep, yep, yep. There's, yeah, you know, some, somewhat, some. It, somewhat. I'm not saying that every single one sure. thinks that way, but some vestiges of that will probably be around. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, right away, when, I, when, when someone says, well, Jesus received this, you don't receive things that you, you only receive things yeah. you don't have. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's like, for me, that's like, ding, 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 yeah, you know, like warning sign. Warning yeah. sign number right. one. Um, like, I, I, like you said, I know what's being said. Right. You know, fundamentally. But but for me, um, and I think broadly for most creedal Christians or whatever you wanna whatever you want right. to call them, um, when we start talking about Jesus receiving something, the assumption is he didn't have it. Yes. Or that there's some sort of need or want or lack right. uh in that. And and that's where I, I start to go, Oh, wait a minute. I right. I don't know if that's the case. Uh I think I think the kind of you know, and I'm not um not probably as well versed on on the real theology or background of this as I should be. But I mean, I think for most people, the spirit descending on Christ at the baptism, um, you know, would be seen at, not as a receiving of a, you know, of a lack of, but sort right. of a sign of, 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 of what God is sort of able to do for us, I think, right. you know, more than anything else. Right. Um, you know, rather than that, rather than that sort of fulfilling yeah. a, a lack. of Well, and I, and I think that like you, you're reading it, it, to me, that that whole thing about Jesus being emptied and then being filled is you're connecting two things that don't necessarily connect themselves in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't say that Jesus received the Spirit within himself. No. Right? It says the dove, the, the Spirit descended in bodily form as a dove and rested upon him. Mm -hmm. that, that's all it says. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anything else. And then he was led. So there's there. And then he was led in Luke 4 led into the wilderness by the spirit yes. and then came out of the wilderness in the power of the spirit. Yes. So that, so we would see that in that charismatic fold as, Oh, the spirit came, descended, mm -hmm. rested, inhabited and led mm -hmm. that would. So the, all of that stuff is read into that, right? Sure, Cause sure. it doesn't actually say any of those things no. in scripture, but that's the, that's kind of the assumption of what happens, which, which it wasn't until I started really studying early church fathers that I realized that, that was not a that was not a distinctly orthodox position, mm, you know, right. little low traditional yeah, yeah. thinking about that. Um, that that was much more a charismatic uh -huh. thinking about that. Yeah. Um, and and like I said, well known charismatic pastors and preachers uh, yeah. would would say those things. So you kind of have to then nuance out the. Well, are you saying that Jesus then was not fully divine for sure. some particular period of time? Sure. Because that's problematic. Yep. Um, that he, if he had emptied himself and then received the spirit, then you said, "Well, he had some." So, so it it becomes very problematic. Yeah, right. um, and I think that when I uh, the my critique of the charismatic church would be, let's get some better theological understanding about mm -hmm. the nature of Jesus, mm -hmm. and not um, not sacrifice our theology on the altar of our experience. Right. And say, well, this is so. Now we had this experience. Let's fit our experience sure, back into sure, scripture. Sure. Yeah. Um, but let's see what does scripture actually say, yeah. and then our experiences in God should be supported by what scripture says plainly. Mm -hmm. Sure. And and yeah, I understand. You know that we we read things into scripture all the time. Right. We have a lens that we yeah. do that through. Yeah. But this is to me, this is this is a pretty important one. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that was something, I, I mean, as you were saying this, I was kind of thinking some of it sounded, yeah, some of it sounded like reading back into, as you said, reading from right. experience wasn't the word that came to mind, but, but that's that's exactly what I was I was hearing in it. But yeah. I mean, as you say, we do it, we do it all the time in yeah. different ways. But, and and yeah. it's it's just the what the natural thing is that people are people have to then clarify what they mean by mm-hmm. this. Yeah. And um and I don't think you need to connect those two things that Jesus emptying himself mm-hmm. had to do anything with the baptism. I think that I mean the Philippians two answers what emptying himself looked like, right? Taking on the form of a servant. Right. Right. So it had nothing to do nothing to do with creating space within or whatever, mm-hmm. however you want to say it, for reception of mm-hmm. the spirit to empower and enable him. So I think what it is, it 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 understands Jesus primarily through the assuming of humanity mm-hmm. and not primarily through the um, the full divinity. Right. Right. And so it em- it overemphasizes one and right. de-emphasizes the other. Right. And I mean, I've heard, I've heard, literally heard preachers say he he came as a man. We have to understand him as a man. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but he also claimed f- to be fully God. Yeah, and spit in the dirt and healed people with I, you know yes. blood and spit and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, special too. spit. Yeah, special, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, it's important. It is. It is important. What's the? What do you think the um, the temptation is there? Like why why this desire to to, to say something like that? I I like to honestly, I think it's that. to anthropomorphize God. Right. Yeah. I think that's what I think. It it makes me more sympathetic to who God is and what He's oh, done. Right. Okay. I I honestly think that's what it is because mm-hmm. then I have a picture of I have a better grasp on a humble God. Uh huh. Right. And and I can picture the humble God there. So I've understood him through his humanity. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's I I lit I think that's what it is. So yeah. it makes me more amenable to his love, to his nurture, mm-hmm. to his compassion, and all these. Rather than just understanding he is all those things. Yeah. Now I've got an image that I can actually see, right. but it's not an it's not a true image that you're worshiping. So does that come, do you think, from a um, I don't want to say a distrust in, this, in, the, in the sense that people don't trust or believe, but do you think that comes from a place where people are sort of afraid of living in a kind of mystery, like to sort of to sort of like a discomfort with saying God is more than I'm able to imagine? Yeah, I think yes. Right. Yeah, I think so. Right. Yeah, trying to and there and the I mean the the specific language that the creeds use, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedon Creed, um, the Apostles' Creed, all of these, Athanasian. the Athanasian Creed, all of these things. Um, are trying to give precise language mm-hmm. so that we don't get into theological error, um, but allowing room for mystery mm-hmm. and, um, and and for the unknowability of God. If right. we're going to talk about them, how do we have language that's informed by Scripture sure. yeah. that allows us to understand how to under how to understand Scripture, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but then uh, but also gives gives us some language for the mystery of God. Right. You know, this language of three in one, yeah, um, sure. this language of uh, especially looking at the Athanasian creed and talking about the, the, the kind of the divine Trinity and how they inter how the interplay between all of them. Mm-hmm. Let's have some language to understand this mystery, but we still acknowledge that it is in fact a mystery. Right. Right. And, um, and it's a, it's from what I understand in terms of this this way of thinking through the Philippians two thing is relatively new. Hmm. It's not yeah. like I I I've not seen it in the church fathers, sure, or in church sure. history. Not that I'm the greatest scholar on all of those things. Well, yeah, uh, but I I mean I read a fair bit, and I it doesn't it seems it's not a normal thought process within that. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So. Um, well, now that we have that sorted. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you for tuning in yeah. and listening. This has been a, a really interesting topic Absolutely, of conversation. Yeah. Uh, if you have questions about this, please um, ask us, yeah, comment, us uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, until next time. We'll see you. Yeah. God bless.